Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, August 29th, and this is the weekly market update. So, in this week's, well, first let me do the disclaimer. The content in this video is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. All content in this video is of a is information of a general nature and does not address the circumstances of any particular individual or entity. Nothing in the video constitutes professional and or financial advice, nor does any information on the video constitute a comprehensive or complete statement of the matters discussed or the law relating thereto. Basically, it's your money, so it's your responsibility. One thing I need to clarify, guys, uh, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just a guy on the Internet. I put my opinions out there. This is for entertainment purposes. A lot of people email me and send me anything in the comment sections, like what stocks. I, I can't give you personal event, uh, financial advice. What I can do is talk about what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. Uh, in the newsletter that I have, the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter, that's not financial advice either. Those are stocks that I'm buying and why I'm buying them. I cannot tell you to buy them. I cannot tell you to sell them. I cannot tell you what to do. I cannot possibly know your individual circumstances, your temperament, or your ability to endure risk. So, you know, I would like to help you. I'd like to have these conversations, but I'm just a random guy on the internet. This should be used to stimulate ideas and then for you to do your own research, or if you have a financial advisor, talk to that financial advisor. Now, with the things that we're talking about here, these are not investments. These are speculations. It's very risky stuff we're talking about, for the most part. So, having said that, uh, I'd like to get into this week's reality check. I'm going to give the politics a little bit of a break. The last video that we did uh, the other day, last couple, talking about where I think, why I think inflation, price inflation in goods and services is going to be coming back, you know, it's a process, not something that's going to happen next week or next month. It's a process. And uh, I got a lot of interesting comments. Uh, some people seem to get it. I don't think everybody gets it. But I think it comes down to it depends how you define inflation. Okay? And I define inflation as the increase in the amount of currency units. And that has the effect then of causing price increases in assets and or goods and services. Why? Because the money creation can happen quicker than the ability of the economy to react and produce more goods and services. Or in the case of Bitcoin, more Bitcoin. Or in the case of gold, more gold. You could increase the money supply at, you know, to infinity uh, with a stroke of a keystroke, but you can only get about, you can only increase the gold, above ground gold supply by about a percent to a percent and a half a year. It's just the way it is. So I think a lot of folks don't understand that. You really have to define your words. You have to define what you're trying to say, because if you don't, then you give the impression you really don't know what you're talking about. And you may not agree with my interpretation. I've had these, believe me, there's guys that have been with me since day one. We do not agree on the definition. Uh, Tony's out there somewhere. He'll probably hit me up in the comments. We have differing views on what inflation is and what inflation is created. That's fine. I'm just giving you my views. I'm giving you my uh, points of what I think it is and what I think is happening. I'm trying to explain it as best I can in these videos. I'm not a professor of finance. I'm not an economist. I'm just a guy. So take that under consideration. Now, one of the other concepts we talk about, and one of the things I think is going to happen, and I'm going to do, like I said in the last video, I'm going to do some more research on this, is negative real rates are going to be instituted. That doesn't mean you're actually going to see the Treasury take rates negative. Okay, That was kind of a misunderstanding that some folks had. Uh, some people in the comments said, well, what's that mean? You're going to have like negative? No. Negative real rates. There's a such thing as, see, so we've got to define our words. Nominal, which is, you look at the number right now, it's whatever the Treasury bill is, you know, 0.25 or whatever the 10-year is. I haven't even looked at it. Say it's 1.5%. That's nominal 
okay, rate, inflation rate, or not, or interest rate, I'm sorry. The real interest rate is defined is, um, means that inflation is higher than the interest rate. And therefore, savers, go to the last bullet point, therefore savers will see a fall in the real value of their savings. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about financial repression. That's what I'm talking about by keeping interest rates artificially low while they increase the money supply, okay? While they, and how are they going to transmit that money supply directly to the economy? Through physical spending. You know, they're right, they're, they've spent trillions of dollars on PPP programs, expanded unemployment insurance, and that's going to continue. Plus, you're going to see, depending on the outcome of this election, full-blown infrastructure spending in the trillions of dollars, whether it's, if Trump gets reelected, it's going to be sewers, bridges, and roads, and airports, and if the Dems get elected, it's going to be the Green New Deal, okay? That's what we're looking at, and they don't have the money, so they're going to just print it out of thin air. That's, read Stephanie Kelton's book, people. You have to, you know, if you're going to come on here and argue about these things or make an argument, you have to argue, we have to argue from the same starting point. You know, and that's what people say. Well, there hasn't been any inflation in Japan in 25 or 30 years. I get it. There's a mechanism to transform the money creation directly to the economy to get the desired inflation. Okay? It will happen. Modern monetary theory talks about how inflation is created and how they will control it. I don't believe they'll be able to, and that's why I think what you're seeing is this reaction. Now, let's get into some meat and potatoes here. You know, we talked about it uh, several videos ago. A very large company, MicroStrategy, the name of the company was, had taken $250 million of their corporate cash, okay, and placed it into Bitcoin. And the reason they did that is because you're not getting any return on the cash sitting in the bank or in short-term treasury bills. It's effectively zero. And at negative real rates, when the inflation rate is higher than the interest rate, you are losing purchasing power. That's why people are going to be moving into real assets. There's no opportunity cost to holding real assets if you're in a negative interest rate environment. Okay? It makes it easy. There's no carrying cost here. So what I found is interesting, and people have been talking about this, and we're starting to see the, the door start to crack open here. I think this is tremendous, this first bullet point. It was a news item. The $16 billion Ohio Police and Fire Pension Fund approved a 5% allocation to gold to help diversify its portfolio and hedge against the risk of inflation. Okay? They didn't go buy more 30-year Treasury bonds or what are going to be uh, euphemistically referred to in the future as they were in the past, certificates of confiscation because the inflation rate will be higher than the bond rate. No, they went out in a pension fund that has to match liabilities to assets because it knows it has retirees in the future. It can map it all out. They went out and put 5% of their assets into gold. This is tremendous news. This is significant. You know, the micro strategy thing into Bitcoin might have been a one-off. That was a $250 million deal. Could have winked it off and said, well, the CEO's a nut or he's a Bitcoin nut or aficionado. This is a legitimate outfit. I mean, there are regulatory hurdles. There are legal ramifications to this. When you are running a pension fund, when you are running an insurance company, when you are doing these things, you have a fiduciary responsibility to the people that are vested in these things to make sure that you are doing things in an appropriate manner, that you're not out speculating and gambling. Okay, And for the pension fund to take a 5% allocation in gold because they think we're going to get inflation. This is, a, this is legit. And what have we heard people like Ray Dalio said? You should have an allocation of gold 5 to 10%. And back in the day, before a lot of you guys were born, back in the 70s and early 80s, when there was high inflation in this country, and Paul Volcker had to raise rates to t over 20% to crush it, we had a tremendous recession. I was a kid when that happened. Like I said, most of you guys weren't even born then. That's what we saw back then. There was a tremendous amount of money that people had stored in gold. You know, that's when last time gold made a new high in 1980. That was the peak. 
And these things go in cycles. And we're entering an end of an era in deflation and entering a era of inflation. And that's what we're starting to see. Here's another vignette. If you want another one, I found another vignette. Snappa, an online graphics creation company, joined the group of companies diversifying their cash holdings into Bitcoin. With its co-founder and CEO describing the world's number one crypto as a, quote, far superior savings technology, unquote. The C now pay attention to what he's going to tell you right here why he's doing it. And this is the exact argument why I'm making it and why the Ohio Pension Fund went into gold. The CEO noted that the decision to invest in Bitcoin became more necessitated when the company's bank cut their high interest savings rate to 0.45% meaning that, quote, the purchasing power of our Canadian and U.S. dollars is actually decreasing after adjusting for inflation. Exactly what the definition of negative real interest rates are and the, what the outcome of is it. So there is no cost, opportunity cost. You're not losing rate interest by investing in these things. They are diversifying because over time, uh, if the Federal Reserve, like Jay Powell, came out, like I said in the last two videos, basically came to your house, knocked on the door, and told you, we're basically going to keep rates at zero for the ne next five years, and we're going to have a targeted, we're going to let this economy run hot. And that's setting it up for the MMT that's coming under whatever administration is in, after the next election. The money's going to get printed. It's going to be spent into the real economy. You're going to have inflation. You're already seeing it. I don't have time to go through it for a chart pack here, but go on stock charts. Look up the chart of copper. Look up the chart of gold. Look at oil. Oil is, is moving into a tight wedge where it's going to break out either lower or higher. I suspect higher. Look at the DBA, the agricultural ETF. It's broken out. Look at lumber. It's up over 100%. Are you starting to get the message? Inflation in goods and services is coming back. And it's, you know, a lot of it has to do with supply disruptions because of COVID and other things and underinvestment and new uh, reserves. But it's going to be like gasoline on the fire with this money printing that's going to happen. And people that are smart can see it. And people in the technology industry, especially a lot of founders, they are big as far as maybe not socially, but at least financially, they're libertarians. They get what the Federal Reserve is that it's a con and a scam and a way to, uh, it's an in inflation engine. And especially people that are in the high technology, they understand cryptocurrencies, conceptualize it, and people can see what it is. Now, these may be one-offs. We may, we may, these may just be anecdotal, but it's a big deal when a state pension fund for firefighters and, and police allocates 5% of their assets to gold. This is a big deal. Again, the CEO of Snappa, quote, the purchasing power of our Canadian and U.S. dollars is actually decreasing after adjusting for inflation. So this is coming. People that are smart see what's happening. And that's what I've been talking about. Okay? It's happening. It's going to happen. Just because it hasn't manifested itself in your face yet, if you understand and you can see over, you got to have that over the horizon radar. You know, on an Aegis cruiser, it has the ability to see over the horizon. It can fire missiles at ships that it can't even see with its radar. Okay, it has technology it's over the horizon. It can see it, see things before you can see them from the bridge. Okay, so it gives an advantage. That's what we're trying to do here. That's 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 the thinking here. Try to see things before everybody else. Try to skate to where they the puck is going to be. Now, a lot of times you're going to be early when you do that. You're going to be extremely early sometimes. But you ha if you have the understanding, if you that understanding, that research and that understanding, that thinking about it and looking at history and looking at how things are, are repeatable okay, and cyclical, and then you get that conviction and that conviction allows you to wait and wait for this to manifest. And that's what's starting to happen. That's my view, at least. I've been talking about energy, oil specifically. I think it's coming back. It's coming back big time, in my view. Here's what I looked at as a possible big contrarian indicator. Exxon got booted out of the Dow this week. 
You know, the removal of Exxon Mobil Corp from the Dow Jones Industrial Average may be a classic contrarian signpost for the downtrodden oil and gas sector. Yeah, I think it is. This is one of the largest companies, oil companies in the world. It's booted out of the Dow. There's only one company in there now, and that's Chevron, one uh, energy company, Chevron. It has a 2.1% share of the Dow. The weighting is 2.1%. That matches approximately the 2.5% share in the S&P. Remember, we talked about that the other day. The weighting of energy in the S&P 500 is at an all-time low. It's at an all-time low. And they say this in the quote, in which I'll put the links to all these articles, uh, from 12% less than a decade ago. But remember, back in 1980, at the last peak when the S&P, uh, when energy was a major factor in the S&P, it was almost 30%. Now, I'm not suggesting we're going back to there, but I would say to you, when energy accounts for 6.2% of consumption and 7.8% of manufacturing and about 10% of the profits for the Dow or S&P, it should, shouldn't probably have a 2.5% weighting. And I suspect, and I've talked about it ad infinitum, probably most of you guys are sick of hearing about it. I mean, you have to really pay attention. You, you can't, you know, the underinvestment has been endemic now for a decade. Shale masked the underinvestment in non-OPEC oil reserves. And those chickens are going to be coming home to roost a lot quicker than most people believe. This is a huge contrary indicator in my view. We're positioned in a lot of energy companies in the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter. So very, I believe, uh, companies, uh, there's one company we have that at $60 a barrel, it's in Canada, the thing has a cash flow yield of like 30%. I mean, there, some of these companies have a tremendous leverage to the oil price, and we don't need to see much more of recovery. We're trading at $43 a barrel. Let's talk about tankers. A couple of articles I found. One of my main ideas or views or theses around why I like tankers is because the fleet's getting older and no one's building new ships. Here's another article that came out. I'll put a link in the show notes. There's har- The title of the article, I believe, was There's Hardly Anyone Building New Ships or Buying New Ships. With orders plunging to a 20-year low due to a potent combination of uncertainty over environmental regulations, that's IMO 2020 and IMO 2030. Remember, 2030 is the greenhouse gas uh, mandate that's coming out that still hasn't been finalized by the IMO. The economic fallout from the coronavirus and a lack of financing. That basically, that's your elevator pitch right there why you want to be in tankers. Why do you want to be in tankers, uh, John, pitch it to uh, Paul Tudor Jones in the elevator. Well, we're at a 20-year, orders are at a 20-year low. Uh, There's a combination of uncertainty over environmental regulations, which I could get into, the economic fallout from corona pandemic, and a lack of financing, plus the fact that, uh, you know, no one's building new ships to replace the old ones. And oh, by the way, as a ship gets older, it can't just be, you know, used till it's 25, 30, 40 years old. These things have to go through special surveys, like we pointed out in a previous video. And as they age, the cost to get the survey done gets higher and higher. You know, another thing plays into this is iron ore prices and scrapping prices. And I think what we're going to see is Q3 will probably be weak for tankers. Q4 will probably be decent. And I think we could see some ships get scrapped in Q3. But let's go on. The IMO, which is the Inter- International Maritime Organization, has brought in significant, ambitious, and important targets around emissions. We've talked about that. That's why there's uncertainty around the 2030 greenhouse gas uh, mandates that are coming. It remains unclear the exact policies and regulations that might be introduced and what technology will be adopted. Ships are long-term investments and buyers run the risk that their vessels will become obsolete. Exactly. Are you going to spend $100 million on a very large crude carrier, and then they say, well, those engines are not the right engines? Now what do you do? I mean, you could pull them out. you got to put it in a shipyard in a dry dock and cut the side of the ship out. I don't even know if you could get it out at that point. It would be a problem. So people are going to be reticent to order 
big, huge ships like that of Suez Max or VLCC class tankers if there's uncertainty that their ship could be obsolete as soon as it comes to the uh, out of the shipyard. Article goes on. Most shipping markets are coming from a relatively poor decade, 2009 to 2019. In terms of earnings, so most ship owners do not have that much cash in their pockets, except some of the ones that we follow in the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter. They were minting money the first six months of the year, basically made their entire 2020 and have been paying down debt and buying back stock, along with paying nice dividends. But that's just my own comment. Here's an important thing to keep in mind. External finance is also in short supply as banks are now largely steering clear of shipping after the defaults they suffered in 2008. Now, they'll come back eventually. This is a cyclical industry. Uh, the supply of ships will constrict. There's no not, New ships are not coming in to replace, yet demand for shipping will be there. And eventually you will get to a tipping point and you will see a... Uh, I don't want, know if I want to use the term super cycle. We, we will have good times. They will get cashed up and they will do like they always do because they're in the shipping business. They will buy more ships. And then that will be the end of the run in rates. You'll have a crash in rates, uh, rinse and repeat like before. But we are a long, long time away from that. There is no indication that that's uh, where we're heading. More confirmation from uh, Frontline, which is a big VLCC owner. VL, uh, Frontline comments on VLCC Fleet Age in a recent, uh, I think it was an earnings call. I'll link in the, uh, got it from an article, but I think those comments were from an um, earnings call. Frontline expects that slowing fleet growth should lead to a sustained period of higher rates in the long term. This year's order book of just 69 VLCCs to be delivered is the lowest since 1997. That's 23 years. So we have the lowest order book in 23 years. However, this is important, the average age of the global VLCC fleet at the end of the second quarter was the highest since 2002. So in the last 18 years, we have the oldest fleet now. So we have the slowest amount of new ships coming in, and we have the oldest fleet in 20 years. That sounds like a catalyst. That sounds like a mix for higher rates uh, down the line as ships are retired. Frontline calculates at 65 will be older than 20 years at the end of 2021, and an additional 85 will be older than 17.5 years. So, you know, you get into, after 15 years, and you start getting close to 20 years, the survey costs go up tremendously, and you might not even be able to get it through the survey. They might say, hey, look, you can't put this thing back out there. Uh, we don't want this vessel. This vessel can't get its papers. So these things can go to scrap, right? And with iron ore prices surging and scrap prices surging, I mean, I've read articles where a lot of the shipbreaking yards in uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India are competing now because there's been a slowdown in shipbreaking and retirements of ships because of the high rates. Well, I think we're going to get like a dip in rates. Remember what I said before about shipping rates. They're very volatile and they are seasonal. So the fourth quarter should be decent, but Q3 might not be. But these are just more comments. It's like these things don't work until they do, guys. That's what the problem is with the cyclical industries for the most part. It's not – that's a general statement, of course. But you have to sit and wait, and then all of a sudden these things take off like gold, okay? I mean, people were sitting around waiting, and all of a sudden, you know, the thing was around 1,200. Now we're at, you know, 1,900. And people are like, how'd that happen? I mean, this is how these things go. And in the meantime, you've got to endure a lot of um, – you know, incoming fire from people poo-pooing the idea, you know. What about all the opportunity costs? You could have been in tech stocks, blah, blah, blah. Hey, you know, when these things run, though, they run like they're on fire. I don't I haven't been talking a lot about uranium lately, but when I see something like this in the news, I feel like I need to get on here and talk about it. There's a lot of, uh, I mean, some guys on Twitter said, here's the people you need to follow on uranium. They threw my name in there. Hey, look, I'm a generalist investor. There's, believe me, there's tons of guys that are way smarter on uranium. That's why I say and advise that people should curate a really decent Twitter uh, group of people that they follow. Because like I said, there's a tremendous amount of people that spend a lot of time specifically to shipping, specifically to uranium, specifically to oil and gas. And that's what I do. 
I'm not an expert on every on anything really, except for the field that I work in, which is uh, electricity production and the building of power plants. But uh, I consider myself, you know, of average intelligence and am able to find people that are smarter than me in these things. However, when I see something like this, I feel like I need to comment on it. Okay. You know, Kaz Adam Prom is the largest uranium producer in the world. They do in situ leaching mining, which means that they put wells into the ground, into the uranium resource, which, which is basically a sedimentary basin, if you will, and they inject acid and water in there and kind of create a slurry and then suck this out on the other end and pull the uranium out. Um, they have, it's like, kind of like oil and gas drilling. There's a cycle to it. And I think in the Kaz Adam Prom recent quarterly report, which I haven't looked at yet, um, they actually talk about the cycle of how this happens. Well, they haven't been able to do that in Kazakhstan for a while because of COVID. They've sh shut down their a lot of their operations. This is a continuous process, right? As you ex remember, in extractive industries, you have to constantly be replacing your reserves and your assets or you will go out of business if you continue to produce that particular commodity and don't invest and find more of that commodity, it's a problem over time. And that's basically what's happened. And I think that uh, they've run into that problem. Cameco, you know, shut down their mines. Uh, they're going to be bringing, back, uh, bringing them back now, slowly but surely. But uh, in the meantime, the consumption of uranium continues. Like I say, I go on the WNA site probably once a week and just there's a tab there, new nuclear. It will new nuclear. It will talk, talk about the news of any new plants that are starting construction, any that go critical, any major milestones like uh, placing the steam generators or placing the uh, cap piece over the reactor housing, whatever. And I see that, you know, every week there's something new happening. A new site came online. I think the site in UAE, the first nuclear power plant in the Arab world, finally came online last week. And that's just the first of many to come. But I don't see any new news anywhere about any new mines being built, being commissioned, or even being contemplated. Yet you're consuming more uranium, you're building more plants, and you can't just go and say, you know, I want to create a uranium mine today. I think I'll go do that and snap your fingers. This is a process. And in some countries, you can't build a uranium plant or mine. They won't let you. There's a tremendous resource in Virginia this outfit, Virginia Mines, I mean, they basically had a like a state Supreme Court basically shut that thing down. Now, you know, you're going to see more of that with this ESG movement. Who wants a uranium mine in their backyard? But we're getting off track a little bit. Let me just get into this Kaz Adam Prom news because I think it's significant. I think it's relevant. And I think it's material. Kaz Adam Prom, the world's number one uranium miner, has started buying the metal, the metal being uranium, on the spot market and may purchase more this year to replenish its stock after the coronavirus pandemic upended the global market. And this is a quote from the CEO. The theme of uncertainty in the uranium market persisted through the first half of 2020. I love these uranium CEOs. I mean, they just can't come out and just say what they really mean, right? The theme of uncertainty. Yeah, the uncertainty is, is that you basically shut down uh, all of your uh, operations because of COVID. And, you know, you still have contracts you have to deliver into. So you've create, you're creating a little bit of a problem for yourself. He goes on to say, however, the general sense is that there has been a shift in sediment. Remember, we like shifts in sediment here. From participants wondering when the market will transition to support current and future primary production to now talking of how soon that transmit, transition could take place. However, although the spot price is up by more than 25% this year at about $31 per pound, it is still, quote, not a price at which there is an incentive to reinvest CapEx. That's what we've been talking about. You need about double the current spot price in order to incentivize people to take the time, effort, and money to go through the process of finding, permitting, building, commissioning, and putting in production new uranium mines and that is going to take some time and it's going to take a higher price and the longer this drags out the longer this price stays down below the incentive price the bigger this bull market's going to be on the upside yes i do believe that when this thing gets going that at some point uh we will exceed the old highs 
I just think that's going to happen. I think the world is moving towards nuclear. I'm seeing even the Democratic Party loosening up their rhetoric around nuclear, even people like AOC. They're not ready to call it a green technology, but I believe they think it has a place. I mean, people that really care about CO2, there's only two choices. we got to lower our consumption of electricity, which doesn't seem to be the plan if we're going to use electricity for heat, for motor cars, for delivery trucks, and for everything else, then we're going to need a tremendous amount more electricity. And you're not going to get it from windmills and solar. So we're going to have to build more nuclear plants if that's the case. So, last bullet point. In the meantime, Kaz Adamprom has already made some quote, opportunistic purchase, purchases on the market through its trading arm. Remember, they have that new trading arm. That's, well, it's not new anymore, but it's in Switzerland. And could need to buy more significant amounts of uranium in the coming months. So you've got both now the two largest uranium miners in the world, Cameco and Kaz Adamprom, buying spot uranium. And then people are going like, well, why is the spot price going down? I have no idea. Okay, I do know this, that uh, at some point the worm's going to turn on this deal. I just think it's positive news. The other positive news is, is the, the hated global, global X uranium fund ETF, URA, you know, reversed itself, you know, because uranium was in the do- doghouse for so long that, You know, it's all about, in these ETFs, assets under management, right? The more assets they can get under management, they can cream off their fees, you know, their 1% management fee or whatever it is. So uranium wasn't doing too good for, you know, a decade. So who was putting money into this ETF? Not that many people, right? Assets were shrinking. So they decided to start getting rid of a lot of the pure play uranium mines and buying things like Rio Tinto or Barrick Gold, this kind of crap or Sumitomo, which is a Japanese trading company, industrial company, Hitachi, which builds everything from stereos to nuclear reactor parts um, to kind of, you know, make it a little less pure play. Well, now that this thing's coming back, they decided to reverse course on that, and they are in the market buying a lot of these stocks back. And uh, if you have followed Twitter, you would notice that the uranium stocks have made quite a bit of move in the last week or so. And I think a lot of that is from the rebalancing that's happening. Uh, it also could be that maybe the market's tightening. And a lot of, like a lot of commodity stocks are moving now, finally. And it's a reaction, I think, to the uh, upcoming commodity bull market, which I believe we're going to be entering. We are in already, I believe, in the money printing. But it's like I said, gasoline on the fire of an already bullish market. Another thing to keep an eye on, you know, somebody said in the comments last week, I don't see any inflation. I mean, are you are you paying attention? Like I said, go to stock charts. You can look at the charts. Look at charts of copper, DBA, which is the agricultural ETF, lumber, um, nickel. All these things are moving higher. They're breaking out. This is a signal. you know. And when oil breaks higher, which I believe it will do, Okay, as we get closer to the end of the year, we're going to break higher. The thing's moving into a more condensed wedge, which means it's either going to break higher or lower. I suspect it's going to be higher. Um, You're really going to see, you know, because oil permeates everything, higher oil prices will be transmitted to other goods prices. And copper, you know, copper has been called the new gold. If we're going to have this energy transition, renewables, uh, even regardless of that, so many things are going positive for copper. There's so much copper used in electric vehicles, wind turbines, the re-electrification that they're going to have to do. I mean, if you're in California, my understanding is you cannot build a house with gas heating or gas cooking. Well, if that's the case and that becomes a mandate across the United States and Europe, which I suspect it will over time, you cannot, you're going to have to rebuild the electrical grid upgrade transformers, all these other things. It's a tremendous amount of copper. The problem is you're not finding new copper. The amount of copper in each ton that you mine has been going down for the last 20 years. And there's not been found a lot of high-grade copper mines. So this is a problem where demand is going to run into supply. This is what we're seeing all across the resource spectrum. All right, we're into this thing for over 30 minutes already. We covered a lot of ground. 
I really appreciate the comments. Um, some of them are not that positive. Uh, you know, you're going to attract a certain element. I don't care about that. Um, I will tell you this. I want to say this again. I don't mean to offend you if you're offended. I don't deliberately go out of my way. I'm not trying to be a shock jock or whatever, but I have a way of talking. I have a way of communicating. I am very strong in my opinions, and I am older than most of you, and I am going to continue to conduct this show the way I want to. It does not profit you to tell me, a full-grown man, that you don't like the way I talk and that I should change, more than likely. You don't talk to grown-up men like that. You can do it on the Internet, I get, and I guess, you know, a lot of you guys, you know, just don't do it. I'm, I'm not interested in your opinions of how the show's conducted. Go create your own channel. There are millions of podcasts, literally, and, and video channels, and they are, you know, they'll, they'll, meet your needs let's put it that way uh the show is what it is it's not for everyone if you don't like it you can change the channel don't if you just i'm just going to spam people from now on if you come on there and say i don't like the way you talk it would be a lot better if you wouldn't talk like that you know what the show continues to grow very quickly uh the up arrows really outnumber the down arrows and most people like i said I don't know. I don't know if people are mentally ill or, like I said, this is just a basis of something that's in society now. If I don't like something at a restaurant, I don't go back to that restaurant. I don't go on Yelp and write you know, an essay about why I'm not going there. I don't write into different websites and tell them I don't like the content. I just don't go there. The market will determine what people want to hear and what people want to see. And so far, this channel's taken off, and I appreciate that, guys. You guys are my audience. The people that like this stuff, I'm going to keep doing it the way you want to do it. So thanks a lot for that. All right, that's it for this week, guys. Take it easy, and we'll try to hit you up a couple times during the week next week. Talk to you later.